was a happy kid. I grew up in the village with a lot of siblings, and I'll tell you about them. But there were a lot of playmates, a lot of play. And in those days, the village, there was a lot of freedom. So when you went out, only, the only time the parents would ask where you were were in the morning when they needed you to go work, meaning the following morning. My father was a strict disciplinary, disciplinary. That's according to my friends, and certainly according to us. He was the kind of father who ensured that if he caught you doing something wrong, you will get his beating, and then you tell your parents so you can get a second beating. So for us, we got double beating, right? You got John Gashoras for the beating during the day and the mom's beating in the evening, so that's how bad it was. However, I would also say that the time that he was most active was when we'd come from the local shopping center where he would go every afternoon to catch up on the news of the day and politics um, and, of course, to hear from other parents whatever mischievous acts their, his own kid had been up to. So when he would come home, you knew whether it was a, going to be a great evening or, or not, depending on how he walked in. If he walked in carrying a stick, your best bet was to pretend you were sleepy and run to bed. Because you know somebody is suddenly getting a lashing that evening. If it wasn't too much of a misdeed, he'll let you sleep. And so you get your beating in the morning, which you'd get with a lot less fury, right? Because he had slept over it. I grew up, as I said, in the village. My parents were tea farmers. My days were composed of working on the tea farm, and then in the afternoons, I'd look after a small herd of cattle, some goats and sheep. My parents did not go to school, but my father had taught himself some basic reading and writing. And in fact, there are those occasions when we come from the shopping center when the things were good, and we come home with the latest copy of Taifa Leo. And those were great times. And of course, as most of you would know who grew up in the village, there are those moments when you'd come home with a kilo of meat, nicely wrapped with yesterday's newspapers. <laughs> Happened often, and we enjoyed it. I had 12 siblings, I was a large family. That's how we grew up. And as I said, I used to look after a small herd of cattle, goats, and sheep. I, I would say the goats were my favorite animals. Now, being in the village, Having goats as your favorite animals is a problem. For the city people, when we go home, I'm sure we all admire those animals, right, when you go to the village. But being the village, you're not expected to have those. Worse still, the fact that I had pets who were goats. <laughs> now, all my friends, boys, who were boys, everybody had a Simba friend who was a dog, a Vovi friend who was a dog, of course, you know, a Chui who was a dog. But here was John, and his pets were these two goats. Now, something about those two goats. When my sister went to high school, and she'd come home and regale me with stories of what they were being taught, I remember being fascinated by one story about one Indian. And I promptly named my goats Gautama and Buddha. I thought that was a fascinating story. <laughs> so you can imagine one Christmas, my horror, <laughs> when, when my father decided that Buddha was ripe to be the family meal. I can tell you, I could not imagine just how loveless this man was to select my best friend Buddha to be our meal. I, I, I loved that fellow. When I got to high school, there were the exciting stories, but high school was really a defining experience. Coming from the village over to high school, you know, here was a guy who had grown up in the village, and I was doing okay in school. And when, being, when I was asked, right before I went to high school, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said I wanted to be an engineer. Now, the truth is, I did not know what an engineer was, because when I was asked why, I said, because I think engineers drive trains. And being from the village, the most complex machine I had seen to date was the train. And so I told everybody, I'm going to be an engineer. You see me driving that train. That's what I thought it meant. But as I said, when I went to high school, it's great to meet people from various walks of life. I met sons of parents who I had read about in the newspapers, 
or heard about on radio. We didn't have a TV then. So it's a great experience. But the most defining moment of my experience in high school was actually in Form 3. Because in Form 3, that's sort of when you start looking a bit into your future. In Form 1, you knew you're being harassed, you're being monolized, as you used to call it. In Form 2, it's freestyle. That's when you have to mess up. In Form 3, you start thinking about your future a little bit because that's when you start making your lifelong friends. Yeah, that's when, for us, that's when the decision will be made whether you're going to be a prefect in Form 4 or not. So it was really important. But one of those moments that was key was that in Form 3, we would elect the officials for the school clubs. We had the historical club, we had the science club, you know, I'm sure you remember them in school. We had all the clubs. And the process of being elected was quite rigorous. You had to form coalitions. So we formed coalitions before there were coalitions in the political center. We did building bridges initiatives to win these elections. You formed alliances back in the day. And of course, there are those moments of handshakes that we had to do quite a bit. So before politicians taught us about these things, we had done them in Form 3. And you went through campaign form teams, and hopefully the, the students would vote for you to lead one of those organizations. My team triumphed and won, and I was elected the chairman of, ladies and gentlemen, the Young Farmers Club. <laughs> it, was, it was one of my proudest moments <laughs> being elected chairman of the Young Farmers Club. You know, you laugh, but you know, what it meant, at least when I was running for that position, is I was going to be in charge of deciding who goes to the Nairobi National Show. You know. Yeah? And it was a big deal, right? I would organize trips for young farmers to go to girls' schools to discuss wink, wink farming, right? <laughs> so that was my job. And I, I was really proud. So when we closed school that April, I went home straight to go tell my parents about this new chairman, right, of Young Farmers Club. So I went straight home, and I got home before my father had left to go to his usual afternoon activity to listen to stories at the shopping center. And I could not wait to tell him what his son had become because the guy who had the terrible accent had come of age. I got home, sat him down, and I told him what had happened, told him how grueling the whole thing of running for position was, how I had to build these collations and how people had to notice me, how I had to do a lot of campaigning, how it was the coolest thing to be elected. And like every kid, you're expecting your dad to say, well done, isn't it? So I sit there and I say, you see what your son has become? Now, when you go to the shopping center today, old man, you have a story to tell your friends, what your son has done. To my horror, the old man just looked at me and really looked disgusted. And I said, what, what have I said that's wrong? And he said, son, you mean I took you to that school, the kind of fees I'm paying to be a farmer? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, you've seen what I do every day, what struggles we go through every day. I took you there because with you going there, I thought you had escaped the village. And what you're telling me is, after everything you know, you've decided <laughs> that you want to come back and be like me. Is that why I'm wasting my money? Do you want to come back and I teach you how we do this? Now, I really felt hot with that rebuke. Because I, as you can imagine, a young man who is really excited to tell about their wins, I couldn't take it. And I remember looking at him and telling him, that's why you never went to school. And it was really, really mean sentence to say, but I had to say it at that moment. Then he took off, and I went to my mom. And I told my mother, I've really been upset with your husband. I did not call him my father. <laughs> with your husband. What happened? So I explained to my mom what had happened. That time I was tearing up. And after telling her the story, how I had gone through this semester, I was still doing well academically, so I didn't see why he was worried about that. And 
she's like, what did your father say? So I went ahead and told her what my father had said. What else did he say? So as I remember what he had said, some of the words he had said were, in you, I see a leader. This is what he had told me. In you, I see a leader. And leaders don't compete on the prowess of a djembe. They compete on arguing ideas. Yes, I never went to school, but don't you have a debating club or something like that where you argue ideas? These are the things he had said to me, but obviously the only thing I had heard was, do you just want to be a farmer like me? So I explained to my mom after I'd come down, remember my mother looking at me and saying, son, your father doesn't always know how to talk to you. And I know you may not understand where he's coming from, but in you, he's seen an escape from this village. In you, he sees a leader. You might one day run a bank. That's what he tells me. And he said, your father loves you very much. And I said, does he even know what love is? And she said, yes. Your father loves you very much. And as I reflected on those words, those reassuring words from my mother, I thought about what it means, what my father was really trying to communicate. And I really thought about what kind of chairman of young farmers I was going to be. And I started to recast myself immediately. And I viewed it more as leadership, as opposed to organizing for Nairobi show, that I was going to change what young farmers was all about. More importantly, I started then think of myself as a leader, seeing further than what my eyes had seen before, which was to be this proud son of a farmer. And I think that's, that sort of defined my future. Because from there on, everything I did, my purpose became leadership. It became so much so that many years later, when I met my wife, she tells me on our first date, I told her that I'll be a CEO of a bank in Kenya. Now, we were not in Kenya then. But apparently, I told her, I shall be a CEO of a bank in Kenya. And when she asked me, how do you know? Apparently, I told her, because my father said so. <laughs> so, to my father, that was love. That's how he expressed love. But it took a love translator, a love translator, my mother, to translate those words. Love sometimes needs to be translated. Love sometimes needs to be translated. Once that was translated to me, those words have carried me forward. And yes, I went on to be an engineer, not one that drives trains, yeah? But I also thought, every time, and today I strive every time to be a better leader. Those words ring true to me all the time. My father died two months before my wife and I got married. Uh, two months before he got married. But if he were here, really what I would tell him is that, you know, you taught me love. In a weird way, he taught me love. And in many ways, I would hug him and tell him how much I love him. Because really, it is that love that he gave me. Now, you know, quite often, when you do things well, you want to be cheered, isn't it? We want to be celebrated. We want everybody to know. And when I went home that April, it's exactly what I was expecting my father to do. I was expecting him to jump up and go to the, to the shopping center and tell stories about his very successful son who has been elected chairman of Young Farmers Club. That's not what I got. But it took a love translator, my mother, to understand that the words he gave me were as full of love as the ones I was expecting. So when someone close to you takes the courage to tell you it's not good enough, you're not good enough, gather the courage to listen to those words, to think through those words, because often they come from a very deep place of love. And love makes the world go round. Thank you.